about what is it that makes it us human. Is it because we're bipeds? Is it because we use language? Is it because we use fire? One of the traits that distinguishes our human evolutionary history is how we grow up in parent and the extent to which we cooperate both as adults and as children. The life histories of humans uh, differ from our closely related species in ways that significantly affect parenting and childhood. Humans today wean their children early. Uh, they have short birth intervals and consequently they are very rapid reproducers and they have juveniles who depend upon others for at least part of their subsistence. These traits are often linked to the evolution of cooperative breeding. Uh, just a tiny bit of background, cooperative breeding is a rare mammalian reproductive and social strategy in which members of a group other than parents help, to help either a mother or her raise her offspring. Um, it's, it's rare, but found across very diverse species, including some primates and humans. However, this was not always the human pattern. These traits are derived <clears throat> since the last common ancestor and most likely in the last couple of million years. We likely evolved from an animal with an ape, some kind of ape-like pattern of long birth intervals, slow reproduction, and mothers and juveniles who are on their own when it comes to food provisioning. So this is a remarkable life history transition, or a remarkable evolutionary transition, not only that we go from an animal who does not cooperate in raising young to an animal who does, but it also involves a suite of other life history traits. So what I want to do today is talk about how evolutionary changes in human parenting, juvenility, and cooperation are linked in a kind of brilliant life history strategy that uh, gives humans um, uh, an, uh, our incredible edge demographically as a species. It's made us very successful as a species. So over the next 45 minutes, first I will make some points about energy transfers uh, life history and uh, cooperation, highlighting those aspects that have been important to the evolution of parenting, juvenility, and cooperation. And then I will put these points together in an evolutionary simulation that addresses the question, when do mothers need others? Uh, and I'll finish then by asking, what is it that we can say about these behaviors in the past? And what I hope to convince you of is that the cooperation between mothers and juveniles is a very important gateway in the evolution of cooperative breeding in humans. So I'm going to approach these topics from three basic frames of reference. Um, first, by, by studying our closest relatives, we can get a sense of those traits that are part of our common heritage and those traits that are unique to humans. And then the second frame of reference that I will use are uh, modern natural fertility populations. And these give us uh, a model for where we have ended up in terms of modern behavior and modern life history. But this leaves a lot of unknown evolutionary space. These two kind of endpoints leave a lot of evolutionary space that we aren't really filling in. And one of the great challenges that we have as evolutionary anthropologists or behavioral ecologists is that what precisely what we are interested in, behavior, leaves no fossil or archaeological record. So the third frame of reference that I'm going to use is a modeling approach so that we don't have to simply rely on the present as an analogy to the past. I'm going to start by showing two uh, energy allocation models as a way to think about how energy flows uh, differ in humans from most other animals. All animals metabolically allocate energy to uh, one of two functions, to maintenance. That's basic, basic um, uh, somatic maintenance, things like uh, pulmonary function, heart function, immune function. And then whatever energy is left over is available for growth in an immature animal or for reproduction in a mature animal. Uh, what I want to point out about this today, many of you are used to this sort of very essential life history allocation model, 
is that this is assumed to be a closed system, uh, denoted by the, the solid line here. And what I mean by that is that the energy available to an individual is limited to the energy that he or she can harvest from the environment. And this model uh, describes most animals, including the great apes. Infants will depend upon their mothers until weaning, but then after weaning, juveniles are on their own and mothers are on their own as well. So we know the situation is very different for humans, uh, that we share food widely, but in addition to food, uh, we often don't think about the implications of labor transfers, that we uh, spend a lot of time doing tasks for other people or receiving the benefit of what other people's, of other people's labor. So for example, and a lot of these pictures are of my research with the Pume, who are uh, hunters and gatherers in Venezuela, and uh, the Maya, who are subsistence farmers in Mexico. So this Pume mother is, uh, she's uh, chopping firewood for a, um, to cook a meal that not only she will consume, but the rest of her extended family. Uh, her daughter is weaving a hammock that she will share with her, uh, her other nieces. So then to account for this flow of food, resources, and labor between people, Peter Ellison and I uh, suggested that a modification was necessary to the, uh, the traditional allocation model to include a mechanism for these, uh, for these transfers, uh, which we uh, called uh, pooled energy. So in humans, uh, an individual's energy is not a closed system, denoted by this, um, the dotted line. Energy can be subsidized both in the form of direct uh, energy transfers in the form of food or uh, to adjustments in uh, energy expenditure through labor transfers. Um, in, traditional, in the traditional uh, time allocation model, activity, as you, as you might have noticed, is not a separate arm. Uh, because it is assumed if you are on your own to produce your own um, calories, you're basically, you're, you're working for those calories, so it's usually subsumed under maintenance and assumed to be a direct function of basal metabolic rate uh, and um, included under maintenance. So we suggest that activity is actually necessary to pull out as a distinct allocation to account for cooperation. So, for example, in most human societies, uh, there will be a central, and, and hunters and gatherers, other traditional people, there will be a central hearth, and then many people will basically either go to that hearth uh, and cook their food on that hearth or receive food from that hearth. It's very expensive to go and um, chop a lot of firewood. So the 500 calories that this Pume mother is spending collecting and chopping firewood is 500 fewer calories that her pregnant adult daughter has to spend or her growing son has to expend. So again, we pull out activity um, as a way to um, account for this kind of cooperation, labor cooperation. Uh-huh. Just a quick clarification question. Would you be able to apply that model to any sort of cooperative breeder? Or is there something about it that you need to do? Oh, that's a good question. No, I would argue that probably for all cooperative breeders, we sort of need to think about um, transfers that, that, that in some ways the system is not closed and that that allocation is going to look different if it's not a closed system. So, um, uh, yeah, so if you want to ask, that was a good question to clarify at that point. Um, uh, so one important uh, implication of this model is uh, to the complex relationship between mothers, adults, and children. In all modern human societies, um, wean children are fed and given uh, other kinds of care, uh, various other kinds of care. Uh, but juveniles also share resources and labor with their mothers, siblings, and others. And this is something no other primate juvenile does. And m one of my primary research questions has been in making sense of uh, both of these human traits. Most research has focused really exclusively on provisioning children as an explanation for the evolution of cooperation. But I would argue that we really need, if we're going to talk about the evolution of cooperation, we really have to talk about both of these uh, derived features. So working with children and adults in several traditional societies has led me to the question, how do we get from an energy uh, system where mothers and juveniles were independent foragers 
to one in which um, they share food and labor. And then what is the implication of this to the evolution of cooperation? So to, pr uh, to put this into perspective, uh, uh, human and non-human great apes differ in several ways that affect uh, parental care and um, children. So first, we have a very short infancy. Uh, so this is showing the different great apes and just the year years at weaning. So humans have this unusually short um, uh, period of lactation, usually lasting between two and three years, whereas in the great apes will nurse uh, infants on the order of four to six years. What is important about this is that the nutrient delivery system shifts from milk to food and mothers can reproduce at a faster rate. In, all, uh, in other primates, mothers raise their offspring to independence during uh, infancy, and then once weaned, juveniles are on their own when it comes to calories. Uh, however, humans cut this short, they cut infancy short, and then do this long period of post-weaning uh, post assistance. The combination of these traits then commits mothers to raising multiple dependents of different ages, uh, something great ape mothers rarely do. So sort of in summary then, we have all of these life history tra traits that are evolving. Uh, likely over the last about two million years, most people who talk about the evolution of these traits talk about them happening in uh, Homo erectus um, uh, type uh, 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 hominins. And um, so we have all of these traits that are changing to get to the modern pattern of short birth intervals, a long period um, of post-weaning dependence, and overlapping young. And because mothers sh uh, nurse for a relatively short period of time, uh, it basically has been a, you know, it's a fantastic fitness strategy in that it alleviates a very basic physiological constraint on fertility. But it is replaced with another kind of constraint, a time constraint, because older and younger children require different kinds of investments and mothers can't do two things at once. They are posed with this time allocation problem, or what we call the modern mother's dilemma. So here's an Ache mom with her three youngest kids, and you know, she's now supposed to go foraging for her four other kids that are back at camp. So somewhere in there, it's hypothesized that we get the emergence of cooperative breeding. And while cooperative breeding is often presumed to be ancient, it's linked to these other life history traits that directly affect parental care is unclear for a number of reasons. And first of all, none of these traits leaves an unambiguous fossil record, archaeological record, or genetic signature. Nor do we have a cooperative breeding great ape model that can help guide us in terms of what this transition might look like from mothers who are on their own to mothers who receive help from others. And um, third, using modern ethnographic examples may not be that informative about what our life histories were like in the past. The evolution of cooperative breeding literature by and large has assumed that modern life history uh, traits as the selective background to the, uh, to the evolution of cooperative breeding. However, the, life, the very life history traits that impact parental care, short birth intervals, overlapping young, juvenile dependence, have undergone considerable modification and perhaps uh, actually in evolutionary time quite recently. So if cooperative breeding is ancient, it likely develops under not yet fully modern birth interval, dispersal, and juvenile dependence expressions. Um, however, this has not been previously uh, explored analytically. So one way to address this empirical gap is to use a modeling approach to predict under what life history conditions are mothers unable to support children on their own and uh, we have called this the force of dependence. I've been working with a, a number of colleagues uh, to model the hypothesis that evolutionary changes in birth intervals juvenile de and juvenile dependence affect this force of dependence. We incorporate what is known about great apes and modern ethnographic populations, and then we use modeling tools to basically fill in the life history evolutionary space 
to estimate the net cost of a mother's children under different life history conditions. So that's a mouthful. Let me unpack that for you. Um, we include several variables that affect parental behavior and have ever undergone significant change. So the first, uh, one of the first variables is birth interval. Uh, we use a, um, we bracket that parameter by six years, uh, which is a ape-like birth interval, and three years, which is the mean for natural fertility populations. And then to quantify changes in juvenile dependence, we use the age at net production, which is the age at which a child uh, produces equal to what he or she consumes. And then we add a third variable, dispersal age, to signify when a juvenile leaves their maternal sibling natal unit. And we include this as a separate term because in human populations, it may not be the same uh, as independence. So in other words, independence happens at weaning in most other animals. And when we actually disperse varies independently of when we become independent. Um, we use a parameter a range of 14, age 14 to age 20. 14 corresponds to the mean age at first birth in chimpanzees and 20 to the mean age at first birth in uh, ethnographic populations. These parameter ranges are intended to encompass the evolutionary space between an ancestral pattern of long birth intervals, early maturity, and juveniles who are independent at a young age to the modern pattern of, of short birth intervals, later ages at maturity, and juveniles who become independent at later ages. We then treat these as continuous variables and map them across the three-dimensional response surface to observe their relative influences on net balance, which is our outcome which is the production of all children minus their consumption. And I take this approach, this modeling approach, so that, again, we don't have to rely simply on ethnographic populations as a direct analogy to the conditions under which cooperative breeding uh, may have emerged. Yes, there were two oh, questions here. Uh -huh. Quick question. Uh -huh. so, do you, so um, are you assuming equal dispersal age from male and female children? Or do you yes. Have at this point, yes, it'd be nice to put some other wrinkles into it. Uh huh. In your so question? Saying, and is that an assumption or is that an observation? That's in a simplifying assumption. Right. Right, right. So that is, uh, yes, you, we could certainly make that more complicated by looking at sex differences, yeah. Uh, okay, so. Um, uh, let, me, let me see this, go back for a second. So um, birth interval and dispersal age are fairly intuitive, um, but the juvenile dependence term is not so intuitive, and so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time explaining uh, what I mean by that. So these graphs may be familiar to many of you. They're uh, Hilly Kaplan's graphs that he's, he's um, 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 published in several different uh, forms over the years, and they're looking at production and consumption for chimpanzees and for humans, for females and for males. So in most uh, animals, so this is showing the chimpanzee line, you can't really distinguish between production and consumption because the assumption is that at weaning, those um, production and consumption approach unity. So that means you're independent and, um, and what you produce is what you consume and vice versa. Uh, so the for humans, this is a very different pattern. So here we get consumption. Uh, again, this, so this is showing age from uh, birth to 75. This is a consumption pattern. As you grow, you consume more. That plateaus out and then goes down a little bit in old age. And then uh, this is showing production, which is very low when you're little uh, and gets uh, it crosses what you consume, sometime highly variable cross-culturally. Um, crosses um, that and uh, then you become a net producer uh, until very old ages. So the point is here in this portion of your life in childhood you're a net consumer, in this portion of your life you're a net producer. And pretty much humans are the only animal that, that would have curves uh, at least to this extent. 
Um, so we can think of this crossover point from being a net consumer to a net producer. I use that then as a proxy for juvenile dependence. Um, and cross-culturally, we know that this crossover point is largely has to do with the production curve, largely has to do with how much children work. Um, and because I'm interested in the evolutionary effects then of changes in juvenile dependence, I want to use a range of schedules to simulate the evolutionary transition from a juvenile who is independent to one who is increasingly dependent. All right, so how I do this then is I use the ethnographic literature to, um, to guide me in terms of what the, a plausible range of values would be. So this is showing, uh, you don't really need to read all of those names, this is showing the numbers of hours that children work cross-culturally. This is showing a whole, uh, this is showing pretty much the complete uh, uh, data set that we have for the amount of time that juveniles spend working cross-culturally. So this is looking at juveniles uh, age um, weaning, or, or actually age six, to, um, to sexual maturity, to age 14. All right, so this is the amount of time they spend in productive work. Uh, and, all right, so for the early end of the schedule, for those for, to, um, to simulate juveniles who become independent at fairly young ages, uh, I use a, um, a Hadza-like uh, schedule. These are the Hadza, and these are the Bangladesh um, cane study with the Bangladesh, two very well-documented studies among traditional people. And so this is showing, this is age, birth to age 20, and it's showing the production, how much kids produce at each age, becoming uh, increasing with age, and then their consumption at each age, and then where that, where that crossover point would be, where, where they transition from net consumers to net producers. Okay, at this point, that early crossover point happens at age 10, again, well documented in several ethnographic populations. The late end is bracketed by a production schedule uh, where children become net producers at age 20, and this is represented ethnographically by the Kung, who are at the lowest end of variation for, um, for children's work in traditional populations. So here's the Kung, uh, and here's showing this late schedule, again, age, how much kids are producing at each age, their consumption, and the difference between the two in the crossover point happening at age 20. So this then are, are my model assumptions, and then this is just showing that they, they do closely replicate um, the range of variation in, um, in, human, in what we know about human populations. So I then use these early and late schedules to basically bookend net production as a continuous term, uh, the crossover point varying between age 10 and age 20. This range is conservative at the early end in that it does not include a schedule where a juvenile becomes a net producer at weaning. So that occurs at around age for a chimpanzee, uh, although, they, although they will often stick with their mothers for another uh, couple of years. So we could extend this out and include those very early, um, those very early ages, but um, would probably have difficulty selling that to reviewers. Um, so production, and just to point out that production uh, excuse me, consumption, I use the same consumption curve in each model because I really want to focus on the effects of, um, uh, to highlight the effects of production. All right, um, let's see, I have used both calorie and time as the, um, as the currency to construct these schedules, so you can think about how much kids work in terms of how much time they spend or how many calories they produce. Uh, and because the human feeding niche is contingent on food processing and many other activities that do not have a caloric value, I um, use time as the most comprehensive measure of parental investment and children's production. Now there's, a, there's another important point that needs to be made here, and that is as children mature, they both consume and produce more. And <clears throat> this shows a schematic view of that. So uh, here's daily hours of work. Here's age, um, birth to age 20. Uh, this dotted line shows consumption. So consumption increases with age. Uh, the red portion of the bar shows that portion of their consumption that is not met by their own production. And the white portion of the bar shows that portion of their consumption that is met 
by their production. So that makes sense. When kids are really little, they're consuming, consuming, they're not producing very much. At some point they start to produce something, they produce more and more and more, until some age they start to produce a surplus. This shows how a child matures, so a single child. But the important point is that a mother living in a natural fertility society doesn't have just one child going through at a time. She usually has several kids. She's got some older, some younger, some more productive, some less productive. I'm sorry, I didn't catch it if you said it. Is this collapsing across male and female children, or is it just showing one or the other? No, this is just a schematic view to, to, to okay. get across the point so that I'm trying to get. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a schematic view. As, as children get older, they, um, yeah, they start to consume more and they start to produce more of their own consumption. Right, so it, with this, this, the shape, the specific shape of this would vary depending upon culture, you know, a whole lot of, of, of variables. Uh, but this is just showing this schematically to make the point that almost all analyses that talk about the cost of children, the evolution of cooperation, talk just about the cost of one child. But what is unique about human life history is that we have these multiple dependents all going through at the same time, and that if we're going to talk about the evolution of cooperative breeding, we need, and the impact that that has on mothers, we need to consider this very important aspect of human life history. All right, so in order to do that, basically what I do then is here are the individual net values. So this is showing, in this case, year after um, uh, uh, year of mother's reproductive career. So this is the first year she starts to reproduce on down through uh, her final years. She has one child. It, can, it, uh, it has a net value, which is production minus consumption. Uh, at each age, and then she has another child three years later, and then she has another child and another child. This is just a schematic view of a three-year birth interval and a child who becomes, children that become independent at age 18. Okay, so in this case, again, most views have just looked at the schedule of one child going through. So what we do in this case is we integrate across a mother's, re for each year in her reproductive career. So these are then the sum of what all of her children are producing and consuming, which I would argue as a mother trying to finance her kids, that's what's important to her, not the idea that 20 years later she will have spent so many, so much time or energy on her kids. Okay, so this is just showing it um, in graphic format, uh, taking these values. So this is showing uh, years since first birth, so this is the beginning of her reproductive career, the end of her reproductive career. This is showing the production of all of her children, the consumption of all of her children, the difference between the two. You can see that, that kids are costly in the beginning of a reproductive career under this schedule, and then they begin to create a, uh, generate a surplus later in her reproductive career. Okay, so I just have tried to unpack analytically how it is that we might think about juvenile dependence and how a mother might experience this unusual human adaptation of having multiple dependents. So in putting this together then, a mother gives birth at, um, at some time, she reproduces for 20 years at some birth interval, her offspring stay in her maternal unit until some age, and at which time they reach independence. Uh, so then we perturb these variables over their evolutionary range and map net balance as a function of them. So this then shows the, the, what the full model looks like. This includes uh, 40,000 iterations or stack surfaces for each combination of birth interval length, dispersal age, and juvenile dependence. And the contours indicate the magnitude of, uh, of net balance. So we can think of net balance as the, the number of hours that mothers need a day, mothers or others need a day to subsidize the cost of their children. So it may be, it may be positive, uh, shown above the red line, um, meaning that they're generating a surplus, or it may be negative, meaning that it's a huge cost to mothers. This will depend upon you know, the, the, the specific life history variable 
and uh, where we are in a mother's reproductive career. Okay, so my goal then is to look at where in all of these 40,000 combinations, where we see that there is selective pressure for, uh, for mothers needing the help of others. So, you know, you can't really make sense of a model that's showing 40,000 surfaces, so let's just, you know, I'll take that apart a little bit. So this is just looking at the endpoints of the parameter range to look at some of what the extreme values might look like. So in this uh, column, we're looking at birth intervals of six years and a dispersal age of very young dispersal age at 14. Here we're looking at um, very short birth intervals and dispersal ages at 20. This is looking at early net production and late net production. And so then this is mapping net the net cost or the net balance across a mother's reproductive career. So you can see in some combinations there is, uh, this is, this then is saying that this is costing, all of a mother's children is costing her less than five hours a day. At some point they generate a surplus. Uh, and we can see at this other extreme that kids, you know, under these scenarios are generating substantial, um, a, a substantial cost. We can think of this combination of traits as being the most ancestral and this combination of traits as being the most derived. Um, but basically the model is agnostic in terms of the sequence of these changes, but we pretty much um, can say this would be the most ancestral and this would be the most derived. Okay. Um, so then to try to sort of uh, see this again a little bit more clearly, here I graph the, uh, the full model in terms of four different surfaces. This is showing six, a six-year birth interval, a five-year birth interval, a four-year birth interval, and a three-year birth interval. This is showing the, the net cost, so cost increases as you go this direction. This is showing age at net production, 10 to 20, and dispersal age, 14 to 20. Um, because I don't have a separate term for um, uh, numbers of offspring or, or fertility, you can, the, the birth interval term basically uh, accounts for that. And so at a five to six year birth interval term, we're talking about a mother who over the course of a reproductive career has four kids. Uh, under a four year birth interval, you'd have about five kids. And under a three year birth interval, you'd have about seven kids. Okay, so we can use this then to make a couple of observations. Um, when the effects, again, of multi-age children going through a reproductive career are counted for, um, the cost is uh, negligible for children to delay dispersal. And so what we're looking at here, this is dispersing at 14, this is dispersing at age 20, and you can see, holding all else constant, there is, there is no cost to mothers for children to stick around uh, for a longer period of time. And this is sh these are shown at a net production age at 10. That means juveniles are productive at young ages. And this is shown at age 15 when they are uh, productive uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a way that's very common in today's ethnographic populations. OK, so, so this is what we're, what we're looking at is a move from here to here in terms of delaying dispersal costs mothers uh, uh, very little, which came as a as, as, as pretty much a big surprise to us. Um, and uh, however, that's true, except under the more modern conditions of late ages at juvenile dependence and short birth intervals. So here we're extending out this surface um, to net age at production it, to 20, and you can see there begins to be a much greater effect at later, much later ages at, at net production, and there's a very strong interaction down here with three-year birth intervals. So this, this more modern form of, of uh, three-year birth intervals and very late ages at net production, um, kids do get to be very costly. Okay, so we can, uh, there are two basic transitions then that stand out uh, in terms of the development of cooperative breeding. First, when overlapping offspring are accounted for, uh, a later dispersal adds really very little cost to a, uh, a mother 
in terms of um, subsidizing her juveniles. Um, and so we uh, might expect this to have, and we would expect that juveniles would become uh, fairly independ young, um, independent at a fairly young age in the past because all other primates are and because um, juveniles are in many traditional societies today. Okay, so under a whole range of life history uh, combinations then, um, uh, Juveniles are not costing mothers that much, and it's not costing uh, her that much for them to stick around a little bit longer. However, a second a transition is very evident when net balances basically are greater than a, what a mother alone can finance, and that she would need to recruit help from outside of the maternal uh, offspring unit um, from other adults. And this happens, is especially a strong effect under uh, when juveniles are very unproductive and when we have uh, very short birth intervals. So um, this model then uses, uh, we can, um, it raises several implications in terms of the evolution of cooperative breeding. Because uh, juveniles are uh, dependent and expensive to raise in our own world and in many traditional societies today, it, this is often assumed to be the motivation for cooperative breeding. Um, and this is in part a point that I made that the analytic framework that we have used really only thinks about one child. It does not think about what it, what it might look like from a mother's perspective when you have a passel of kids moving through a mother's reproductive career. From that point of view, kids are not that expensive. Uh, and the cost of children is low enough under many life history combinations that mothers do not need to rely on adults to handle at least some modification of the ancestral pattern of long birth intervals, singleton dependence, and independence at weaning. So the second implication is that because delayed dispersal is the least costly life history transition, there's no increase holding other variables constant, from a mother's perspective, um, from an optimization point of view, we could argue that delayed dispersal is likely an early transition in the evolution of human sociality. That's from an optimization point of view. Um, so is this consistent to what we can reasonably speculate about mothers and juveniles in the past? So while there is, unfortunately, very little we can actually know about the evolution of behavioral traits with any kind of concrete evidence, it is, uh, I think, pretty reasonable to speculate, a point that I've made, that since all other primate juveniles are self-sufficient foragers, that juveniles in the deep hominid past would have been as well. And um, we've seen that if juveniles were um, contributing only at an intermediate level, which we would expect early in a transition to modern life histories, from a mother's point of view, it cost her little for those juveniles to stick around. And it may also significantly affect their chances of survival. So most explanations for why it is that we have seen, why we have such gains in juvenile um, survivorship is because they are subsidized. So this is comparing infant survival and juvenile survival for chimpanzees and for human foragers. And interestingly enough, there's been uh, really almost no movement no change in infant survival um, when we compare the two species. It's, you know, it seems like there's just really not much more that mothers can do um, in the absence of very modern um, technology. So in our, in our own society, this is about 99.6, but we're talking about in human foragers. Um, and then, but where we see the huge effect is in juvenile survivorship. So almost double the number uh, the probability that if you are born that you're going to, to survive to age 15 or reproductive age. And this is often attributed to the fact that a juvenile who is provisioned during hard times, especially when they are sick or injured, has a much greater probability of surviving than if you are self-sufficient. Uh, so while a juvenile has much to gain by being dependent in terms of its survivorship, uh, why would a self-sufficient juvenile and mother form a cooperative unit? 
And the common answer has been kin selection. Juveniles are sexually immature. There's no chance of them reproducing themselves. Uh, but they, so they can't contribute to their own fitness, but they can leverage their non-reproductive status uh, into an indirect fitness benefit by helping their mothers and their siblings to whom they are uh, uh, very closely related. So I've, there's, I've given you uh, several reasons um, why juveniles might stay in their natal group and mothers might tolerate this. It's a relatively low cost to mothers. Uh, it increases juvenile survivorship. It's also a benefit to mothers. And for juveniles, there's some kin-selected kin um, indirect fitness benefits that it may gain if it stays and help out. But this does not answer why this happens in humans and not in other, uh, in other animals. So the question is, why is it that humans and juveniles have formed cooperative groups, whereas we don't see this in our close relatives? So um, across, uh, across animals, we know that staying in one's natal group um, is, is closely associated with very strong group living benefits. And I'm going to offer a couple of suggestions why it is that the mutual benefits, specifically of foraging efficiency, labor economy, and the division of labor, which have all been documented in other cooperative breeders, um, are particularly germane to humans. So first of all, the human diet is very complex. It incorporates a broad diversity of plant, animal, and aquatic resources. These are often located in disparate locations across a landscape and transported back to base camps. Um, uh, humans are central place foragers, which is not um, completely unusual in other animals, but is unusual in many of uh, many primates. And that means is that we create uh, base camps and then go out and forage and then come back to that base camp rather than, in a sense, moving as a group through a forest or through a landscape and eating our way through. Uh, and uh, we have enormous day ranges relative to other to other primates. Um, our day ranges are in the order of two to five times greater than a chimpanzee. And we when we start looking at annual or lifetime foraging ranges, they are on the order to 10 to literally thousands of times larger than um, a chimpanzee's. And um, most of the food that we eat requires extensive processing, you know, minimum cooking, pounding, something like that, and then uh, sophisticated technology to, um, to process those foods. So I would argue that this introduces a time allocation constraint for an individual of any age to be self-reliant. That these challenges make it difficult for a juvenile to be on their own, but it also makes it really difficult for an adult to be on their own as well. So relative to adults, uh, immatures are energetically inefficient bipeds. And we know this um, from sort of the extensive sports medicine literature has shown that, especially over long distances, kids are very inefficient walkers and runners. Um, and so if we have bipedal young that are limited as long distance foragers, and we know at some point we really increase our foraging range, um, juveniles may specialize in overproducing foods and processing resources at which they are efficient and do not require long travel distances in exchange for resources that are, um, that are further from home and that they are less efficient at producing. So for example, this, uh, this Pume boy, he can go to a fishing hole not far from camp and he can produce enough fish each day to feed himself and his family. And likewise, his sister can go to the wild mango grove, bring home enough mangoes, cook enough mangoes for herself and her family each day. But both of these juveniles also rely upon adults for hunted food and for tubers, which constitute about 40% of their diet. So this goes back to the point I made earlier that we have juveniles are, it's a confusing picture in humans because they're both subsidized and they are, uh, and they are helping. But the human feeding niche, uh, which in does include a wide, wide variety of foods that require many different processing steps, 
uh, opens up many new tasks that juveniles can um, perform uh, easily in and around um, these um, central base camps. Adults may overproduce some resources, they may underproduce other resources, and juveniles may as well. Uh, children may target different resources, they may perform easier or less skilled tasks, they may not be as efficient as, uh, as adults. Um, to kind of drive that point home, a self-sufficient chimpanzee spends about five hours a day foraging, which is equivalent to the time that uh, our modeled early net producer spends working. So a juvenile who would otherwise work hard to support himself may cooperate at little added cost. Um, so juvenile dependence may not develop. We usually think of it as, as juvenile dependence develops. They work less and less and less, and others have to fill in. It may instead really represent a shift towards task specialization and, a, uh, and a, uh, an age division of labor. Lots of attention has been paid to the sexual division of labor, much less to the age division of labor. Um, and uh, the age division of labor and juvenile cooperation uh, which are often overlooked in humans, um, are well documented in other uh, cooperative breeders. So finally, a natural history of shared goals that involve children um, is suggested from our unique capacity, um, or the unique capacity of human children, to develop coordinated activity and cooperation early uh, in life. It, it seems like if we're going to grow up as a cooperative adult that we would also have an ontogeny of cooperation as well. So in sum, because human, modern human juveniles are subsidized, it is often assumed that children place a significant burden on mothers and others. And consequently, most models and speculations about the evolution of cooperative breeding have focused on the expensive cost of children as being the motivating factor. Um, most studies specifically have focused on the help of grandmothers and on the help of fathers. Um, however, my research has suggested that perhaps we've overlooked a much simpler source of help uh, and that all those children cut both ways. Uh, that juveniles are seldom the target of investigation, perhaps per because they, um, they present less of an evolutionary cooperative challenge because they're not sexually mature. They're not giving up reproductive opportunities to help. Um, they're immature, um, which is exactly my point, is that it really, there is a low opportunity cost for them to uh, cooperate, especially if they're spending close to the same amount of time uh, just feeding themselves. Um, the role of juveniles in the evolution of cooperation is important, um, I think, to reconsider for a couple of reasons. Um, juvenile dependence has likely undergone significant transformation during hominin evolution. Again, we often assume a modern model when we talk about these things that were happening, evolving maybe two or so million years ago, and um, you know, it's likely undergone significant transformation. Um, because all other juveniles are independent foragers, I think that's the place that we should start to think about how juvenile dependence changes over time. And that what we would expect is that younger juveniles get knocked out earlier and over, older juveniles uh, stay productive as they are in many, many traditional societies. Second, that ethnographic populations alone are unlikely to provide a complete analogy to model the evolution of cooperative breeding and, and I would argue the evolution of most life history traits in, um, in the past. Um, model results pointed to those transitions in human life history where the selective pressure would have been strongest for cooperative breeding and we saw that the demands for cooperative breeding are very sensitive to the assumptions that we make about other life history traits. Again, driving home the point that we need to think about this as a changing landscape, not as a static landscape that looks like today's. Um, and then we saw that some combinations incur very little cost to mothers. There could be some movement in life history changes 
that really didn't cost, uh, cost mothers very much. And others uh, do incorporate, um, uh, do include a very substantial cost, especially short birth intervals. So if cooperative breeding is ancient, then we do need to think about it uh, with respect to this changing landscape. And, and finally, improved survivorship, juvenile survivorship, and the mutual benefits of maternal juvenile cooperation may be important mechanisms in prolonging natal phylopatry and be an important trait in distinguishing the sociality of um, early hominins from, other, um, from their other relatives. All right, so thank you very much. And I'm just going to be blatant here and say I'm looking to hire a postdoc if anyone is interested in working on some of these models. So thank you very much. I think they're going to see if the, so, yeah, if the, if the food's you. there, because I think then what we'll do is we'll, you'll, you'll, you'll adjourn and get some food, and then we'll continue. Okay. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so everyone Okay, lunch. all right. Great. Oh, thank you. So how is the labor of the, the juveniles coordinated? Are the mothers getting orders? Um... Oftentimes, yes, right. So that's a, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, kids kids know what they have to do. I mean, yeah, no, the mothers are giving orders. I mean, what I've noticed is that the um, parents will tell their kids to do almost nothing except about work. In other words, they won't tell their kids don't get dirty. Mm -hmm. You know, don't go over there and do that thing. Don't play with that. You know, spider over there. But they will say go go do that. So they are given they are given uh, direction certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the different birth intervals, mm -hmm. you're assuming that all women in
Okay, so that's a great question. And, and yeah, the, the graph that I showed, you couldn't read all the little writing mm -hmm. about what all those little societies were. But I mean, I get, um, I guess the reply I often give. Is your mic I, on mute? I think so. Okay. Uh, the reply I often give to that is that, um, you know, the, the, I think one of the big reasons why we think kids are very unproductive is because of the Kung example. And, you know, so the Kung are the first group of hunters and gatherers that are really studied. There's, you know, like so much, we have so much great data about them from the 60s and onward. And those kids, retrospectively, work freakishly little. But the other thing is, is that when you actually go to look at that data, it's very slim data. Uh, and Richard Lee, you know, says, if you go back to some of the original stuff, he says, you know, Kung children don't go out foraging, but they crack all of their mangongo nuts by age eight. So no one was interested in food processing. They were, it was, the currency was always calories in the past. And I guess... I've tried to make a real point that, you know, what's really unique about the human feeding niche has to do with time that we spend processing and really the currency, the currency of just calories. Yes, kids, if you were just to look at foraging returns, um, they would, you know, they're very un unproductive probably in most societies. So anyway, so there's that. Um, it, but on that graph, what it showed is the Kung, who work the least of any documented nat traditional society, are right next to the Hadza, who work almost the most. So I think that we cannot categorize hunters and gatherers as one thing and agriculturalists as another thing. I think it is very uh, ecologically specific. And the problem has been that, that uh, you can't, th that graph, you can't, um, while I've tried my best to include uh, like things, people include different things in their calculation of children's work. So just kind of following up on that, I, I thought you made a very strong point with the central place foraging strategy, and it's always struck me that uh, kind of a critical age with regard to that is between sort of four and just before seven, because children at that age are big enough that they're actually pretty heavy, right? That is, they can't walk very far, but they're difficult to carry long distances. Um, and yet, they're also not really competent enough um, to deal with a lot of hazards, right? So one part of your model, and I, I think maybe um, Aaron was, was alluding to this when he asked about um, uh, whether you were treating males and females equally, um, is that if you include in there the advantages of having children who are capable of processing at the camp and engaging in child care, then you can get over that kind of, you know, too heavy to carry, um, too young to be independent. So seven, eight-year-olds, you can let them go. They can do all kinds of things. Um, uh, they can walk pretty far and so on. You know, five-year-olds, somebody's got to look out for them or they fall in, you know, the fire. They, uh, bad things happen to five-year-olds. Uh, and maybe uh, using the currency of time rather than the currency of calories, you can include that in the next model where um, a lot of what, say, the seven, eight-year-olds are doing are keeping the five, six-year-olds from dying. Right. So child care, I do not include child care. And that's for the reason I don't do that is that that really is um, uh, reported in highly variable ways. So I, I guess my feeling on that was that the vagaries of ethnographic reporting would guide my results more than actually the true behavior. And it's the case that, I mean, I just noticed that in the, in the time allocation studies I've done in my own populations that, you know, some mothers are just super indulgent. I mean, some mothers just never let those babies go. Other mothers, you know, uh, don't hold their babies so much. And so if you, you know, to the point that it would make them look like they're working, tw you know, 20 hours a day versus eight hours a day. And so it just seemed like because of the inconsistencies in reporting, it's really hard to get at. But certainly there is a strong, and it's actually Tom that was really important in pointing this out, that there is a strong bimodal distribution uh, in, in uh, child care where it's the really little ones who actually do the most child care. They don't, that's, I mean, I guess that's my point in terms of the division that there is an age division of labor, they can do that. And then at some other ages, they can do different things. But it's unfortunate that, that a lot of child care is um, not very evenly reported. 
I think the argument you're making about the long distance foraging of hunters and gatherers is quite interesting one in, and then introduced the notion of an age difference or age, age based labor because that certainly makes a lot of sense to say that in effect if you have adults who are doing sort of long distance foraging who's doing the short to medium distance foraging and having the children or juveniles fill in that aspect of it which they can do uh, it's a very sort of a different <coughs> aspect to it which makes it look a lot, makes it a little bit clearer in the sense of the way in which while the juveniles are not necessarily fully independent in terms of what they're producing and your data seem to indicate that with the uh, you know, the total amount that the, the mothers are getting from all their kids that they're nonetheless contributing an important aspect to the total amount of food that needs to be brought in and so that's, I find that's a very interesting aspect um, but it then raises the question and goes back to the, the comment you're making about well, why aren't the chimpanzees, why aren't the primates doing the same thing which then ask the question, well, why are, people, why are hunters and gatherers doing long-distance foraging in the first place? Right. And certainly another model would be that they're not doing long-distance foraging. They there's nothing that requires right. them to do it, but rather had to have a payoff. And so what are the conditions under which doing long-distance foraging itself has a payoff? And could one be using that as part of the argument for why you are so shifting to this longer period of time of juvenile de dependency, that is, if you've got selection for something like long distance foraging, in order to fill in that medium niche, you need the juveniles to be doing that, and they sort of go part and part and parcel together. And could one sort of put the burden on the conditions under which uh, long distance foraging has a payoff? That is, why would they do it in the first place? Right, right. Yeah, so unfortunately, you. Um, um, I'm not, uh, I've, I've tried to always stay away from ultimate causation arguments, but you find as you start to make, as you start to make your argument at some point, at some point you've got to point, you know, pin the tail on the donkey. And, and so, uh, right, so the environment seems the least, uh, seems kind of innocuous, but um, you're right, so that would be interesting. And, and I guess I'm, I'm also hesitant to send this back terribly far in time. Um, but, you know, for whatever reasons that bipedality becomes an important part of our adaptation, um, there is this really interesting thing that happens where juveniles are not as efficient as adults. And there's, I don't know if there is, maybe some other people in the room know more, but we go through a growth spurt, um, and, um, and at this adolescent growth spurt, many animals go through spurts during puberty of different kinds, all different kinds of, of, of um, sort of body parts go through growth spurts, but specifically ours, why most of our attention's been paid to our total height, what it really is, is it's our lower limbs that are spurting. So it's not our torsos, it's our limbs, and that's why it has this effect on, on efficiency as bipeds. And I don't know of other animals that, um, that might do that. I would think for a quadruped, maybe you wouldn't do that, I don't know, anyway. So the, the clue might be in if are there other animals that actually go through a growth spurt like that. I don't have an answer to your query, but it does help to answer the, the problem that Dwight posed, which is, I mean, one strong argument about one of the benefits of bipedality is the efficiency of long distance running in adults, right? So as you posed it, Dwight, if I understood you correctly, you were suggesting, well, why, why have long distance foraging a central camp? Well, because the kids can forage locally, so the adults go farther away. But it may be the other way around, which is that because we're bipeds, we're good at long distance running as adults, right? Uh, and that sets up central place foraging, which then sets the stage for having the kids fill in for local foraging because they haven't gone through the growth spurt. So it's it's not a, that is, bipedality is a, is a central place foraging is preempted by bipedality, um, and long distance foraging is a consequence. Of that. Right, right. I mean, part of it is that, you know, the environment becomes more of a mosaic and that we, um, um, it's, it's maybe not so you know far how far we go, but that we you know the, the yeah the the blame the culprit is usually the brain, and uh, I guess I've tried to avoid that, but I guess the brain being this energy hog that it is uh, that needs a stable uh, energy supply as a youngster, uh, you're going to have you're going to have a, a food strategy that has lots and lots of backups which means you got to go, you know, 100 miles that way to make sure you know about the quality of the resources there and you got to know about the quality of the resources 100 miles that way and that way and that way. 
in order to, you know, basically um, get that brain, to, to have evolved that brain. Let me just make a, okay. a small response okay. to that, which is that uh, hunters and gatherers are not ubiquitously long, uh, central place foragers. No, they're, they're not. They're variable in terms of that. And there are groups that uh, are not central place foragers. <laughs> and so that one could say, well, yes, yeah, the bipedalism gives us the ability to travel over long distances, but it may be not necessarily for purposes of central place foraging, but it could be simply in terms of, of non-central place foraging, but over long distances uh, where you're doing a lot of traveling, I don't know, from a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so it, again, it sort of begs the question as to why would, under what would be the circumstances under which long distance foraging might, if, if that is sort of the push, what is the conditions under which that would be uh, would that sort of take off in the sense that there is a real push for not just the long distance foraging, but a whole suite of other things to make it to an effective kind of uh, strategy. As anyone could imagine that you know, perfectly good bipeds uh, who are not engaged in, in central place foraging at all. Uh, we know that historically this is the case, I mean, well, in terms of how to gather this is the case, and certainly in terms of the archaeological evidence, uh, if we go back to Forty or thirty thousand years ago, good evidence that um, in many cases when it's talking about, if not our ancestry, at least in Neanderthals, has not been central place foragers, but obviously. All right, I'm using that term very uh, loosely, in, in that we don't just eat our way through the environment and then sleep when we're done eating. Yeah, and I, I would you argue that that's not been the pattern for a long time? Well, it's just that there's so much variation, as I understand it, with hunters and gatherers, it's sort of hard to say, kind of, you know, to use one of them as, as to say, well, because we, ha we have bipedalism, which allows us to move over long distances, that leads us to do central place foraging, and, it, and then therefore X, Y, and Z follow from that. Because one could well imagine that all the bipedalism is there, but may not necessarily be translated into central place foraging. So, so what's, I'm just, I'm ignorant. What's an example of a hunter gathering group that acts like a chimpanzee group where it's just stationed in a different place every night and Well, every night, uh, well, there, I mean, there's been a discussion about hunters and gatherers in terms of those that essentially go out and forage and bring back to a central location and those that, when the resources in that area are being exhausted, will move as a group to another area. Oh, they do both. No, absolutely. My, my foragers do that. Yeah, they, they, you know, but, but the point is, is that they, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's, I'm using it uh, in a, um, yeah, in a very general sense that we do some form of uh, going out and bringing resources back and that people go in different directions and do different things and somehow they meet up at night. Um, yeah. Yeah, but that's a, that, but that's a good uh, line of inquiry for the future, definitely. This is doing what you're not supposed to do when you talk about modeling, which is making things messier, right? And I, so, but I, I keep coming back to thinking about these gender differences because they seem <coughs> like every piece. So, like in the in the Kaplan graphs, right, the point at which you become a, a net producer is quite different for females than it is for males, right? And then, um, and, and the and the it's a much steeper. Um, uh, peak for males than it is for females, at least for the Ache. Um, and then dispersal is often sex biased, and age at first reproduction is often sex biased. And then the types of work that girls and boys and men and women do is often also uh, quite different. So, but, uh, but as you said earlier, these things also vary a lot by culture, right? So I, I'm just wondering, how appropriate you think it would be, as you keep modeling this, to have separate graphs for males and females, and then for mothers, depending on the sex ratio of their offspring, how these things will differ? I, I mean, it's not a very clear question, but I guess I'm just asking general Well, no, I mean, so, uh, uh, certainly um, uh, that would be a useful, probably, second step. I mean, I guess I would think that the, I mean, 
although I was a student of Hilly Kaplan's, I guess I would argue that there is that huge difference between males and females because they're using calories, not time, and that when I've used time, males and females look remarkably similar. Um, but um, so there's that. But I mean, certainly, um, I mean, I guess I would, if I'm, if I'm, I mean, I keep trying to imagine it not from the present looking back, but from the, from the past looking forward. And that, you know, certainly we have sex differences in foraging behavior in other primates. I think those only get more extreme, I guess, as we get, um, you know, sort of more recent in time. Um, and I guess, yes, so I think those are useful things. I've just, I feel like we've paid no attention to the age division of labor and that it's just really important to kind of highlight that. But, um, but certainly that would be a useful, that's why I'm looking for a modeler. <laughs> Yeah. Right, but I guess I think in a in a large evolutionary scale, those would there would have to would there not have to be sort of systematic trends in one direction that were continuous for it to have a net effect? I mean, there may be short term of, of variations, and there may be within population uh, variations. But I'm not sure if there would be directional. Um, or am I missing something there? No, I would. Yeah. I mean, that was some of the comments that Dwight brought up, too, is that, uh, I mean, I think um, you could look at it at different uh, t time scales. I'm, but I'm un I guess I'm unclear to how to think about some of these things. No, I am, too, because it hits so many different points, mm -hmm. right? And so it's hard, like, because mm -hmm. girls start reproducing usually, typically significantly earlier than the boys do, too. So if they don't become, in your model, if they don't become nutritionally independent until age 20, but they start reproducing at age 16 or 17, which happens sometimes, right, that they're still getting supplemented, but they're actually increasing the problem. <laughs> so do any of the primatologists know that in the room? What, what the, I, I'm assuming that the age at first birth deviates more in humans than it does in non-human primates. That males and females have a closer age at first birth than than yes. In most natural fertility societies, it's differ, different by about two years. Do you know the answer to that, Susan? Or yeah. Males mature later than So so that's guiding it, not something else, though. But it's guided physiologically, not. Uh, well, no. Actually. Okay, just mating mating opportunities. Okay. No, I guess I know the answer to that question. Sure, that would be the case. Yeah, yeah. many animals, it's that way. Yeah, there's greater skew. There's less skew in humans. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Right. 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 Yes. I uh, I really appreciated this talk, especially the it seemed to me the importance of the birth spacing interval of your graphs. If you have kids three years apart, uh, there's a whole different uh, effects than if it's six years apart. Um, but one question that is, uh, if you could comment on what's been thought of as the um, as the other or secondary gains of having cooperative reading, which is intersubjective awareness, cognitive complexity, the juvenile uh, learning spurt, which is incredible, the ability of juveniles to hold complex social scripts in their minds, the understanding of intentionality, all of these things, which would have had co many consequences other than energy uh, production and conception of food and, and mm -hmm. other resources, they would have had secondary gains, other gains, that mm -hmm. would have benefited the community in addition to their ability to produce food and so on. And mm -hmm. comment on that because that's been, it seems, that's been thought of as a hallmark of the juvenile period and its advantage for human evolution. That is, it's outside of my expertise and I don't know a lot about it except that I do you know I do think it's very interesting this very very early ability for 
um, for kids to cooperate. And so it seems to me funny that we haven't paid attention to, you know, most of the psychology experiments, et cetera, have focused on other kinds of cooperation, I guess, because our kids don't really work, but it seems like that's a very logical place for that cooperation to have had an early feedback, um, you know, is, is through their economic participation. Um, so I don't really know, but that's certainly, that is certainly really critical, and, and I would assume that there is synergy in that at an early age. Um, it's just, you know, I, I you know probably in your own career, you probably appreciate that, you know, kids have largely kind of been forgotten or, or, or I mean, there's a whole field of child psychology, but I think they, in anthropology, they've really been not paid, paid much attention to. I mean, what are the unfortunate yeah. consequences in, in psychology, developmental psychology, certainly in the U.S., is the excessive focus on mother-child dyads in attachment theory and learning models and other things as compared to SIB and cooperative learning and learning of responsibility and nurturance, and w which are much more common around the world and must have been much more important during this evolutionary sequence that you're describing. This is an observation about right. how far off a lot of the human development models are today, given what you're showing was true. Right. I mean, ethnographically, what you appreciate is how much kids, you know, um, you know, kids raise each other. I mean, kids are uh, n not just uh, j not just economically, but that they're um, that parents do surprising little um, formal teaching to their kids, uh, and there's really very little uh, directed attention between. I mean, there certainly is you know lots of bonding that happens with little kids, which we have focused on, but with older kids, uh, they aren't socializing with the with their parents much. They're mostly socializing with each other. Feature of disequilibrium that the psychologists don't appreciate is all this developmental psychology on play, right? And I mean, when children have the opportunity to work, they will, right? So, you know, they play at work here because they don't have the opportunity to work, right? If they could go out and get something to eat, they'd probably be quite motivated to do that. And so the boundary between play and work starts to disappear when mm -hmm. you look at the natural context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's see, there's a bunch of different questions. Maybe I'll just go around the room. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, I had a question about the length of the reproductive age uh, span. So you took a value of 20 years, uh -huh. which seems to be a bit uh, sh uh, short compared to the modern population, although I know the age of the anarchy has been going down with uh, nutrition and so on. So I was wondering whether this is something that is observed and whether that's uh, physiological um, for the population you're looking at, or if it's behavioral, in, in which case it may uh, or had some trade-off between actually co-creating with your parents' childbearing at the expense of starting an early uh, childbearing, or for the mother stopping early so that she can then contribute to her grandchildren. Uh, so have a right, right. So certainly that 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 can, that can vary. I don't uh, I don't think that the the effect that that would have on the model is that it would affect the number. So. Um, I was just talking to Dwight about how I, I don't parameterize fertility or mortality in the model, and that's because it is, um, uh, it's basically assumed under the birth interval term because I limit the reproductive career, so you can only have, you know, the three things that affect the uh, numbers of children are beginning, ending, and birth interval. So I just made that more parsimonious um, in that way. Um, so you could, um, so at a three-year birth interval, you're basically ending up with seven kids. So that's, you know, there's not hardly any human populations that exceed that at the population level. So that's why we chose that and that it is, you know, it's based somewhat on reality that, you know, average age at first birth, average age at last birth. But you certainly could vary that. It just would affect then the number of, uh, it would affect the number of offspring, the way the model is currently set up. What was that? I'm afraid we're out of time. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. Okay.